Welcome to this episode of the Disease Du Jour podcast on the topic of equine neurologic exams with Emily Schaefer, BMD, DACVIM Large Animal. I'm your host, Kim Brown, publisher of Equimanagement. The Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you in 2022 by Merck Animal Health. Dr. Schaefer is a clinical assistant professor of internal medicine at the Marion DuPont Scott Equine Medical Center at the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine. She is currently a fellow in equine emergency and critical care at The Ohio State University. Her research interests include emergency and critical care, acute kidney injury, the acute equine abdomen, and equine neonatology. Dr. Schaefer is also a permitted treating veterinarian with the FEI. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Schaefer. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Well, this is such a a critical topic on neurologic exams because especially with everybody worrying about herpes virus, but there's so many other things that can cause neurologic signs. So when you hear that you got a possible neurologic horse to see before you even arrive on the farm or the horse comes to the hospital to you, what steps do you take? Right. And that's exactly what every veterinarian should be asking, because a lot of times it's it can be daunting. And I, I think in order to make it less daunting, if you think about it in a, in a logical stepwise fashion and have a plan before you even arrive to the farm, you're going to feel better prepared in evaluating this horse and giving advice to the owner. I think one of the most important things is, as with most of our cases, is getting an accurate history and most of that is going to be vaccine history and whether or not you administer those vaccines to that horse, you know, that history might be easy for you to access or you might have to get that from the owner because a lot of our neurologic diseases, or I should say some of our neurologic diseases can be prevented or ameliorated by vaccination. In addition to that, travel history, exposure to other horses, you know, alluding to your comment about herpes virus, that that is really important and it will dictate how you uh, assess that case and how you manage it and it, whether or not you bring it into your own hospital. If there are certain risks, you may choose that maybe this would be a better one to see on the farm and not have this horse travel if you suspect contagious disease may be part of it. So I think history uh, from the owners, vaccines and where that horse has been are, are two of the important things to get before you even see the horse. And then once you get to the farm, uh, of course, then you can start your evaluation. Okay, so as you're going through this process of before you even see the horse, what sort of differential diagnoses are you thinking about in your head? Yeah, again, good question. That's it, some of them, you know, most common things happen commonly. So, and the horse is going to be EPM, um, maybe neck arthritis. We mention rabies frequently, and it, it is very rare. Um, but I think EPM, neck disease, and depending on the time of the year or the region that you or the horse is located in, something like West Nile virus. That being said, those are good things to have in your head as you're approaching the farm. But I think that your physical exam and doing your best to localize this lesion, find what you would consider to be the neuroanatomical localization, you know, even without specialty training, that that is possible. And that's really what's going to form your your differential list, because you're not you know, if your only complaint about this horse is that his hind legs are wobbly. Well, it's probably not West Nile virus. There can be different things that that you'll you'll base your list on based on what's actually going on in the horse. Well, let's talk specifically how you do your step-by-step neurologic exam. Okay, so you you get to the farm or the horse comes into your facility. What is what are the first things that you're thinking about when you see that horse? After I've talked to the owner about what their opinion is, because uh, sometimes the way they describe, you know, what we would call a presenting complaint is once you get more information out of them and them to use their words, it, it may turn out that, you know, for example, the horse isn't neurologic at all. And so getting the owner to talk to you a little bit about what they're actually complaining about can be really helpful in helping you do your, your, your assessment. But to the real question, how to, how to do a neuro exam, uh, when you first arrive into the barn, taking in the big picture, and before you ever lay hands on this horse, 
or have anybody even get it out of the stall. Ideally, you're looking at it in its own environment, whether that's the stall or even the pasture or, or its interactions with this environment. And that step one would be assessing mentation and finding out if this horse is bright, alert and responsive all the way down your your lists of mentation options that that vary from BAR, QAR, um, obtunded, stuporous and comatose, right? A including things like um, head pressing, if there are any other abnormalities that would suggest intracranial disease. In addition from looking at them from a distance, e assessing their mentation, and then seeing how they are postured without any interference. And what I mean by that is, uh, if you're looking at their head, you know, assessing where their ears and their eyes are doing for their mentation, really you can do a, a, a brief cranial nerve assessment by just looking at facial symmetry and how they're interacting with their environment. Are they eating? Can they prehend food? Um, do, they, do they have atrophy in their face? And then right next to cranial nerves would, would be that physical posture. How is that horse standing? Are they leaning against the wall? Are, are they just pointing a leg one direction or the other? Is their tail cocked in an abnormal position? And that can tell you a lot before anybody ever even puts a halter on this horse. And of course, there are extremes on both ends. You know, the neurologic disease may be very subtle, say in a performance horse, that you're going to have to go through your complete neurologic gait exam prior to finding any deficits. And then there are the, the horses that are called, you're called out on emergency for because, you know, it's a, you know, what we call a, a sidewinder where it, it can't stand upright or it, it can't stand without leaning against a wall. And those, those are obviously quite significant. Um, but, but you can, you can start to figure that out by just looking at them in their own environment before anybody touches them. Yeah. And then after that, um, what I what I like to do is get a, a little more involved and start off with a, um, a facial expression cranial nerve exam. And those those cranial nerves, those have been the same for a very long time. So even every once in a while, just refreshing yourself with your old vet school notes, because sometimes that can be really helpful in figuring out, do they have any not only cranial nerve disease like a facial nerve paralysis where they have a droopy lip or a droopy eyelid. But if they have a head tilt, they might have vestibular disease. More subtle things like um, eyeball positioning and your, your pupillary light reflexes. Those can all really help. If you get a moderately thorough assessment of those, you can help, you can start to figure out if there is brainstem involvement or more localized involvement to, you know, say a, a THO or something like those horses with, with the, the facial nerve and vestibular signs at the same time. And then uh, a bit of reflexes and in our dogs and cats, you know, we'll do things like patellar reflexes and tricep reflexes. And those we certainly don't do in our, in our at least our adult horses. But we do do cervical facial reflexes. We do cutaneous trunk eye reflexes, mostly with a pen, right? You're just tapping down the side of their neck and across their trunk. And you're just making sure that those nerves that are coming out of the spinal cord to innervate the skin are functioning appropriately. And then um, symmetry of not only the face and the facial expression, but get the horse to stand as square as possible. Ideally, now you're maybe in an aisle way or somewhere with plenty of room around the horse. And, and you can look at the hips Look at their, the way they're standing. Look at the gluteal musculatures. Put your hands on them. See if there's any asymmetry, even of, say, the neck muscles or the shoulder muscles. And then look, look at them straight from behind and see if their hips are even, gluteal musculature, et cetera. And, and again, that can help you localize if there's a, a problem specifically related to a muscle group that would be a specific nerve origin from the spinal cord. And after that, you can move into your gait exam. And again, taking all of this into consideration as far as safety of the horse, safety of the, of the handler, because those severely ataxic horses can be, um, uh, can be dangerous to handle. But of course, if, if you do have somebody that can move this horse for you, then watching them just walk in a straight line and, and, and evaluating their foot placement, um, the decisions that they make about where their feet are, and then some more subtle things like trunkal sway, or again, holding that tail off to a side and whether they plate or not, you know, are they tracking straight? Some neurologic disease as sort of an interjection will be, 
ataxia is sort of defined as an irregularly irregular gait. <laughs> so there's going to be some things that are coming and going as you're watching this. And that's, that's what neurologic disease is. But if you watch them on a straight line, you can watch for those things. And then usually what I do is I, I keep them on a straight line, but I alter some things and I'll have my handler lift their head up significantly. And, and that's the, that's twofold, you know, that can change the position of the cervical vertebrae. And if there is some dynamic compression, you know, maybe from osteoarthritis or something that can make it worse, exacerbate it. But it also takes that if you if you can get somebody to lift their head high enough, you can actually take out that visual compensation of the horizon. And that's what the goal is, is that you lift the horse's head high enough that he can no longer see the horizon and use visual compensation to make his ataxia look better than it is. And so sometimes what you'll see there is a hypermetric gait. When you lift their head up, their front legs get really floaty, you know, to the point where they, they may very well step on the on the handler. So you do have to be careful um, or they, they might pace. They turn into an um, ipsilateral to beat gait. Um, or they might just flat out refuse to move <laughs> because they, they know that it's going to change and they don't feel comfortable that way. So walk them in a straight line with their head elevated. And then I usually move to a bit more complicated movements like, like a serpentine. And there we're looking for foot placement, appropriate foot, foot placement, pivoting of the hind legs. And then this term circumduction that we use a lot. And that's where usually where we see that is the hind legs on a turn. And the outside hind leg is making basically a, a C shape in its flight pattern. And it's different than abduction, where the leg would just be taken straight out and placed down. This is sort of a swinging pattern that does abduct, but then adduct. And usually there's a flopping motion with the way the foot hits the ground. And again, it's neurologic disease. So some strides may be worse than others. It varies a bit. But on the on the turns of the serpentine and then what we'll progress to later is these very small circles like five meter circles where we want the horse walking forward so not pivoting but we want them walking on a very small circle and that is usually where we see things like um, stepping on themselves interfering circumduction in the hind legs and those can be our, our most telling signs of the low grade to moderate disease. And the other things that we do, of course, are also a tail pull. Back, we go back to that straight line and we, and we as the horse is, the, the hind leg that's closest to you, as that leg is about to touch the ground, give a good solid steady pull on that tail towards you and then compare it to the same thing on the other side. And some horses, it's really obvious. Some horses... It's a 1,200 pound horse and you barely tug on them and they practically flop over towards you. And obviously that's abnormal. But sometimes there are just subtle differences between the left and the right or the way they recover from the tail pull that they they may be able to resist somewhat. But as you pull them over towards you in their attempt to recover and get back on a straight line, they interfere with their hind legs or step on themselves again. And that, that's where you start assessing it, whether or not this horse is neurologically normal. Some other m things we do are, if you have it available to you, incorporating changes in footing or surfaces, like you, you could try um, um, stepping over something. I tend to use the edge of a black rubber mat and I, I serpentine the horses over. I'm lucky enough to have sort of a long hallway that has a, an option of a change of surface. So I serpentine over that. And even though that so that that's quite a safe error to make, right? If you only have a, a half inch rubber mat or so, if they don't place their foot perfectly on that, it's not a tragic error. But it it does tell me that the horse is maybe not judging where he's putting his foot appropriately. Most normal horses will choose to put their foot firmly on one side or other of the change in surface. You can use hills. Um, and then you can, of course, do things like elevate their head up and down hills. But that, again, takes an experienced handler. So I think that's the majority of the of the gait exam. Work on your summer scan. Enter for the chance to win a Global Pocket Reader Plus in Merck Animal Health's Sizzlin' Summer Sweepstakes Giveaway. The Global Pocket Reader Plus is an ISO-compliant universal microchip scanner for horses. 
It is able to read and store up to 3,000 unique microchip identification numbers and displays and stores microchip temperatures when reading biothermal microchips. Enter before August 31, 2022 by going to www.merck-animal-health-usa.com forward slash species forward slash equine forward slash summer hyphen sweepstakes. What I would like to talk about next then is, is how you use that gate exam. When you watch these horses move, because we do this solely at the, at the walk, right? We're not doing this at the trot like a lameness exam. Uh, it, based on, on what you see with these gates, you can determine uh, what, how, how badly the horse is affected. So I would encourage you as you're going through these exams to, to attempt to grade them and then secondly, attempt to neuroanatomically localize them. And we'll get into that in a second. But the grading system is actually quite similar to the AAP lameness scale. It's on a scale of one to five. It's called the modified Mayhew scale. And it ranges from, we'll go backwards actually from the top. So a grade five, the most severely affected horses, they're recumbent. They can't get up. They are down. And no matter how much you encourage them, they can't, they can't get up. Grade fours are horses that are at risk for falling over. Those are those horses that are leaning up against the wall, sidewinders. You, you certainly don't want a child trying to walk them because the, the, those horses may actually fall over. They just can't control their legs well enough. Grade three are on a straight line. Probably most people could see it. So obvious on a straight line. Probably most horse handlers would know that that horse is neurologically abnormal. And then two and one are a little more subtle where a grade two is a horse that's consistently abnormal under those special circumstances that we talked about. Circles, changes in surface, head changes, head position changes. And then a grade one, it really takes kind of an expert eye to appreciate. And those horses are having inconsistent changes, abnormalities. Sometimes they're present, sometimes they're not uh, in these special circumstances. So a grade one is, is what we call mild, and it would take it and an expert eye to, to really appreciate it and, and diagnose it appropriately. After that, once you've kind of decided how neurologic you think this horse is, and let me take a moment to explain that this grading system and the localizations that we're going to talk about are um, predominantly what we call spinal ataxia. And there are different types of ataxia. Spinal ataxia are, are these proprioceptive deficits where somewhere between their head and their tail is affected. But there's vestibular ataxia as well as cerebellar ataxia. And those have somewhat different clinical signs and they don't really fit this grading system quite as well. But that being said, the majority of the horses that we see in the field are, if, they're, if you're getting called out for neurologic disease, it's, it's likely to be spinal ataxia. But keep in mind that that's not the only type of neurologic disease there is, right? So to move on to the, the localizations, outside of the spine, there's still things that could be intracranial disease. And that's mentation abnormalities, like we talked about, seizures, head pressing, or brainstem where their cranial nerves are affected. They might have, that can also affect mentation. The, the awareness system of an organism resides in the brainstem, the reticular activating system. And that, that's what regulates the sleep-wake um, consciousness level. And then, you, and then you get into spine, right? So then you have your cervical region, your C1 to C6, and those, that's when all four legs are affected. And then you have that cervical, um, I'm sorry, thoracic intumescence, so your C7 to T2, where all four legs are affected, but they're different. In that intumescence region, you have your lower motor neuron signs to the front legs where you have weakness, but then you have your proprioceptive deficits in the hind legs. And then as you segment this back, then next, you would have your thoracolumbar region, your T3 to L3. And in those, if that's affected, your front legs are going to be fine. The horse's front legs are going to be fine. The, with the hind legs, are still affected. And then you get back to your pelvic intumescence, where you have L4 to S2. And that it creates similar lower motor neuron problems to the hind legs, weakness. And then, of course, beyond that, you have cauda equina. And, and again, to kind of round that out, that's where oftentimes in our physical exam, you know, we're, we're looking for tail tone, anal tone, and uh, just enough of a history to know whether this horse is urinating and defecating normally. Because if you have incontinence or retention 
of urine or feces, then that's going to make you think that something's wrong with the cauda equina. And that's really important when you're, you're considering equine herpes virus myeloencephalopathy or, or not, is, is thoroughly assessing that caudal end of the horse. So that's the spinal cord. So you have head, spinal cord, but then nerves come out of the spinal cord and into the body. And those can be affected individually. So you might not have an ataxic horse, but you have what we call a peripheral neuropathy. And that's things like Sweeney, you know, our suprascapular nerve that gets damaged when a horse runs into a post. That's not spinal ataxia, but it sure is neurologic disease. And then beyond that still, you have your, where the nerve communicates with the muscle, and that's a neuromuscular junction. And the most famous disease that affects that is, is botulism. And so those horses are what we call neuromuscularly weak, diffusely all over the body. And that's, that can be really helpful. Like I said before, if, what, if, once you know where you think this neurologic disease is, that's really how you're going to formulate your differential list. And so doing your exam, your static exam, your mentation exam, your reflex exam, and your gait exam, then you can really start to put together with where is this horse affected? And if it's his spine, how badly is it affected? Can I grade it? And then lastly, what are the possible differential diagnoses for this problem? And from there, of course, you can go into diagnostics and treatment. Wow. And I guess everyone, every veterinarian has their own, but that seems like such a great step-by-step way to go in and, and probably would make you a better observer if you're doing this every time to the horses. Well, that's exactly the point. So there are m- multiple um, perhaps tests that I didn't mention or tests that I do that maybe somebody else doesn't do all the time. And that's exactly the point that if you have something that you've learned over the years, I can tell that oh, I know a horse should be able to do this movement this way. And this particular horse is not. As long as you standardize it and you do it the same way every time, then that works. You know, for example, hopping horses, we used to pick a front leg up and lean into the shoulder and make a horse hop on one front leg. I will say most veterinarians probably don't do that anymore. But if that is something that works for you and you found that that is rather telling uh, to a horse's neurologic state, then I would, as long as nobody gets hurt, I would encourage you to keep doing that. That's awesome. So once you have done this, how is it, I mean, what, sort of tests might come after this once you've localized? Yeah. Again, because EPM is going to be our most common disease, at least in in my area, East Coast, um, Midwest, and it's a little less common on the West Coast, but it is such a pervasive disease that frequently one of the, the first things that we'll do is a blood test for an EPM titer. And that's that's what we consider a screening test. That is not a definitive diagnosis, right? So those horses, they're, they're ones that we're looking for a titer. And as we all know, horses are exposed to this at a very high rate, right? And they can have, their body can react to that. Their body develops titers because they've been exposed to the sarcosystis, but that doesn't mean necessarily that the sarcosystis is causing neurologic disease within the spinal cord. And so we use it as a screening test to say, well, let's pull some blood. And if it's negative, then of course you have a short time period where acute disease can manifest prior to titer development. But if you have a negative titer, then EPM is much less likely. It's not impossible, but it's much less likely. However, most of the horses that you pull an EPM titer on, they're going to be positive. And so you just have to make sure that your client is aware that, sure, I can do this test. And if it's positive, it doesn't mean it has EPM. What it means is that EPM is a possibility. The next step that you would do for EPM is a, is a spinal tap, right? And so that's a lumbosacral, or if you're feeling confident enough with it to do a, a C1, C2 tap. And both of those can be done standing, um, fairly simple, but they're, they would submit that CSF for testing at EPM. And there's a ratio there. So you know, if if that indicates EPM diagnostic, um, it, a diagnosis of EPM, then absolutely treat. And I will say that that second step of collecting CSF, right, that doesn't always happen in the field. 
And it may not be wrong to treat for EPM on a, on a positive titer if other things have been ruled out. And so what that means then is that you might have to do some other tests additionally. And because common things are common, depending on the age of the animal, if it's an older horse, probably an attempt at getting radiographs is warranted. And take a look at that neck. If, if you think it's a C1 to C6 lesion, which again is, is most common in horses, look for evidence of, of arthritis or trauma or fracture. Courses do crazy things. And if you can get images of the thoracolumbar area, if that's where you think it is, if it's just the hind legs that are affected, then that can be helpful knowing that usually our field equipment is, is not going to be able to get a thorough evaluation of the thoracolumbar spine. But I would say some blood work, a CSF tap if the owners are willing and you're comfortable, and then probably some uh, spinal radiographs. And of course, at any point during this, if the owners want the, a, a thorough neurologic exam and diagnostics, referring to the local hospital with a with not necessarily a neurologic specialist, but maybe an internist could be very valuable if that's what you guys want. Well, that's that's a great tip, and that's I, I learned a lot today. That was uh, that was very thorough, and I've seen a lot of veterinarians do neurologic exams. They all have a little different, but I like the steps that you went through, especially starting by standing off from the horse and observing. That's a really important one, especially if there's a bit, you know, a lot of these neurologic, especially if it's an emergency, these cases, there can be some high tensions on the farm. And it's important to, to remember where, where to start and get as much information as you can so that you can make the, the decisions that you need to make. Yeah. Um, and again, training owners to make sure that they observe themselves and relay all the information. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I, I remember a veterinarian who was in a hospital setting and a horse came in that was neurologic during the height of EPM being spread in Kentucky. And as soon as he looked at the horse, he quarantined it and put like everything in the world because he said something's wow. not right. And turned, come to find out, they did do a spinal tap on the horse who became recumbent, and he had rabies. Oh, wow. So, I mean, it was just the, the observations of trained veterinarians. So just being able to go out and do that. And I know I think you and I had talked before we started recording. You talked about using your observation skills on normal horses so that you can kind of judge more what's not normal. Uh, there was a good... Uh, example I had of that myself in my younger days when I was trying to evaluate a horse for botulism and it was a mild case and so it wasn't a slam dunk and my mentor at the time had asked me to check the eyelid tone and see you know, how easily you could lift the eyelid and at that point in my career you know I was like I, d I did that and I lifted the eyelid and I thought I don't know I can lift his eyelid is that normal is that not normal <laughs> And the point being, okay, we'll do the horse, you know, in the stall next door and compare eyelid tone there and really being really recognizing what's normal and doing the when you're out there all the time doing these physical exams on horses. And so, you know, thankfully, with preventative care, that's one of the benefits of preventative care is to so that your vets can recognize what's normal and what's not normal in, in all of these animals. Just a wonderful tip, especially for vet students and, and young veterinarians. So is there anything else that you can think of that you would like to help share with veterinarians about neurologic exams? Actually, there is. There, what we didn't talk about today is the neurologic disease associated with vitamin E deficiency. And again, that could be its own entire hour lecture, yeah. but it's, it's, a, it's pretty important and it's important in the very young stages of, of an animal's life. For a, a long time, what the most commonly associated diagnosis with vitamin E deficiency was equine motor neuron disease. And that's an adult horse that comes off grass or somehow is vitamin E deprived. And they basically start atrophying and get their postural muscles get very weak. And that's because of demyelinization of those nerves. And you can treat it. Oftentimes it becomes irreversible, but you can treat those horses and improve them, but that's a late stage disease. What's, what we're seeing more now, and in talking to 
specialty neurologists, equine neurologists, um, it's not an uncommon diagnosis, is to find subtle spinal ataxic horses, spinally ataxic horses that you can't find another diagnosis for. What that means is that if it's EPM negative or it's cervical radiographs are normal and there, there are lots of other subtle things that might go into these vitamin E deficient neuropathies. But what we, what we tend to see is that we can't, we cannot diagnose these anti-mortem effectively or accurately. And so these are post-mortem diagnoses, unfortunately, but it is really important to recognize that there are some other, other diseases out there. And when you're talking about vitamin E deficiencies, these often affect horses in as far back as in utero and in their first year of life. And what tends to happen is that they might experience a transient period in those two early life stages where they didn't get their vitamin E. And then as they go on to develop in training and, you know, they're six, eight years old, they're starting to develop some neurologic abnormalities at that stage of their life. If you were to test their vitamin E levels, it might very well be normal. Hmm. But the development stages of their nervous system experience a vitamin E deficiency and is now making permanent deficits. So these diseases that occur when horses have their vitamin E deficiencies at that transient stage of life are what we're calling EDM, equine degenerative myeloencephalopathy, or the histologic diagnosis, the neuroaxonal dystrophy. And those are things that we, we can supplement horses with vitamin E, but like I said, a lot of them at that stage of their life, they actually have normal serum levels. And so that can be frustrating for owners to, to wrap their heads around, and understandably so. But it is important to run some diagnostics and, and see what we can find if there are things that we can treat uh, or, or if there's not. But that being said, making sure that pregnant mares and foals and young horses have plenty of access to grass pasture or a, a good appropriate liquid vitamin E supplement can be really important in preventing neurologic disease later in life. Well, that is a great tip. I didn't realize that it could become normal again when you test but that it has permanent, you know, defects that are caused by an early yeah, life. Absolutely. And, and it, you, most people, right, most people have no idea how, how their horse was raised. They have no idea if it had a vitamin E deficiency when it was six months old. So that's oh. tough. Okay. Is there anything else? I mean, I know we could talk about this for days and weeks, but is there anything else just on the neurologic exam that you'd like to include, Dr. No, I, I think we got it. I think we covered a lot of stuff. We covered a lot of stuff. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Schaefer, on Disease Du Jour. And we thank all of our listeners for joining us. And a special thanks to Merck Animal Health for allowing us to get together and talk about some of these health issues. And we invite you to listen to all the episodes of Disease Du Jour. And if you have any questions or suggestions, send me an email to kbrown, that's the letter K Brown, at equinenetwork.com. Disease Du Jour is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of the Equine Network, LLC.